Dan Lewis again. In this, the second lecture, we're going to talk about languages and texts of the Bible. The Bible comes to us from ancient manuscripts that are copied from originals in ancient languages. We don't actually have even a single original text that was written by a biblical writer. But we do have very ancient copies, and those ancient copies have come down to us, passed from generation to generation, and preserved very carefully by people of faith throughout the centuries. The original languages of the Bible are three. The first one is Hebrew, which is the language of ancient Israel. The Hebrew language came into its own in about the 14th century BC, which is when the alphabet was standardized. And all of the Old Testament books, except some rather small portions and a couple of books, are written in the Hebrew language. This second language, Aramaic, is what forms the rest of the Old Testament. And basically, it occupies uh, a section, uh, a couple of sections, actually, of the book of Ezra, and also a major section in the book of Daniel. Aramaic uses the same alphabet as the Hebrew language, but in fact, it is a different language. It is somewhat like the relationship between, say, Spanish and Italian. There are a lot of common words, uh, but it is a distinct language. And as I understand it, if a person speaks Spanish, there's a fair amount of Italian they may understand or vice versa. And Aramaic and Hebrew is somewhat like that. Plus, there are a few words in the New Testament that also are in Aramaic, usually words that are directly associated with the sayings of Jesus. Finally, there is Greek. And Greek is the largest portion of the New Testament other than those few words that I mentioned just a moment ago. Greek was an international language of the Roman Empire, just as Aramaic was the international language of the ancient Near East. By the time of the apostles and Jesus in the first century, Greek was spoken throughout the Roman world as the basic lingua franca of the empire. And so while everyone probably spoke their own vernacular, most everybody also spoke Greek to some extent. Because the Bible was fixed in its three ancient languages, translations of the Bible began even before the time of Jesus, at least translations of the Hebrew Bible. The first of these is called the Septuagint, usually abbreviated by the Roman numeral 70. About two and a half centuries before the time of Jesus, when the Jews had established a large community in Alexandria, Egypt, they began to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And in time, this was completed so that the Greek translation of the Bible was widely dispersed throughout Jewish communities who lived throughout the ancient world. Jews who lived in Rome, Jews who lived in Asia Minor, Jews who lived in Persia, Jews who lived in Egypt, all would read Greek. And because of that, the Septuagint was a very valuable translation of the Bible, since for many of them, they no longer read Hebrew or perhaps even Aramaic. In Palestine, there were also translations of the Hebrew Bible, this time into Aramaic, and these are called Targums. These translations are generally not thought to be precise translations. They're probably more along the lines of what we would call paraphrases. But nonetheless, they were used in the synagogue readings of the day. And this would have been the Bible that Jesus probably listened to much of the time when he was in the synagogues as a boy in his hometown of Nazareth. And then by the early Christian era, there are various other translations that begin to appear, most of these done by Christians themselves. Translations into Syriac, into Coptic, into Latin, into Georgian, and various other languages. The texts of the Old Testament are carefully footnoted in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And you will see various kinds of footnotes. If you, and if you look at them carefully, you'll see that there are QMS footnotes, which refers to Qumran manuscripts or the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is the VG kind of manuscripts, which refers to the Latin Vulgate. There is the SYR manuscript, which refers to the Syriac translation of early Christians. There is the Septuagint, which is usually abbreviated by the Roman numeral 70. TG means Aramaic Targums. And then you have what is probably the single most important Hebrew text of the Old Testament, abbreviated as MT. That is the Masoretic text. This is the basic text that we use when translating the Old Testament. But we will make references to all of these other existing translations and other texts. One might ask, why would we not use the Dead Sea Scrolls as our basic text for translating the Old Testament? 
And that question is easily answered because the text in the Dead Sea Scrolls are almost all fragmented text. They are not full text. But the Masoretic text, by contrast, is a full text. Here is a, uh, a slide of the Isaiah Scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is actually a very complete text. And in that sense, it is one of the more rare texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Very beautifully written. This is the Leningrad Codex, which is the Masoretic text and is the oldest complete Hebrew Bible now in existence. It dates to about 1008 AD. Someone may ask, why do we not have older texts than the Masoretic text? But this has to do with the fact that in the Jewish community, Hebrew texts were used in the synagogues and they eventually just simply wore out. And when those texts were worn out, they would be carefully copied onto new manuscripts and the old texts would be reverently buried in what is called a Genizah. Usually these were secret burying places and we don't actually know where they were, although occasionally we stumble into them in some kind of excavation project. But this is why the Masoretic text is preserved in copies much later than the text was produced by the ancient biblical writers. This particular text, the, the Leningrad Codex, is in the public library at St. Petersburg, Russia, and it has been carefully reproduced by the University of Michigan a few years ago so that it is available to scholars in photographic copies. Codex Sinaiticus, which is usually uh, signified by the Hebrew letter Aleph, uh, is a complete New Testament and most of the Old Testament. The Old Testament would be Septuagint. The New Testament, of course, would be the Greek that it was originally written in. And this is in the British Library in London, England. Also very important is Codex Vaticanus, which is in the Vatican Library in Rome. It does have some missing parts, uh, more missing parts than Sinaiticus, for instance, but it still is a very early witness to the text that comes from about the 4th century uh, AD. And then there is Codex Alexandrinus, another very important text, which is a complete text of the Bible, and this is also in the British Library in London. Now, when we talk about texts of the New Testament, there are several ways that the New Testament texts come to us. The oldest are called papyri. This, these are texts that are written on papyrus sheets. But the disadvantage of papyri is that it is highly biodegradable. And so unless these texts were preserved in very dry climates, such as northern Egypt, they tended to disappear in time, either from simply breaking apart or uh, actually since they were made from, uh, from reeds, uh, bugs eat them, uh, various kinds of things happen to them. So we don't have very many of these. The earliest of them date to the early 200s AD, and they would include things like P46, P66, P74, the early papyri. In addition to these, we have unseals. Now these were written on parchments, so these are much more substantial and much more enduring. The codexes that we just looked at, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and Alexandrinus are all codexes called unseals in which the Greek letters all are written uppercase letters. By the 9th century AD, we find a new way of doing Greek, which are called monuscules. These are texts that are written in kind of a cursive hand in Greek. Uh, many of them were used in the eastern side of the empire as texts to be read in churches. We also have ancient versions, such as Old Latin in the 2nd century, or Coptic in the 3rd century, or the Syriac Peshitta in the 4th century, various of these versions that were made by Christians. And then finally, we have lectionaries for public reading. These would be portions of scripture that are read in church, and then the quotations of the church fathers. In fact, someone has speculated that you could construct much of the New Testament simply by how much it is quoted by the church fathers in their writings. Now that may be a bit of an overstatement, but they did quote it a lot, and so they become an important source for our texts of the New Testament. Here are some images of some of these texts. The Bodmer Papyrus II, which is P66, is in the Bodmer Library uh, in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. This is a very important text that contains the Gospel of John. Then there is P75, also in Geneva. This contains the Gospels of Luke and the Gospel of John. And if you look at the image that is shown there, you will notice that the edges are frayed, that there's going to be a few places that some missing letters may be there, but we can establish that from other texts. And then there is P46 of the Chester Beatty papyri, which contains the earliest letters of St. Paul. Part of these are in the University of Michigan, near where I live, 
and part of them are in Ireland. Uh, but together they form the earliest witness of the texts of St. Paul. So this ends the second lecture.